Good evening, my name is Jaroslav Daniška and I will speak in English tonight. Uh, I'm very happy to um, discuss tonight with uh, Professor Rocco Butilione, man who faced huge pressure uh, 14 years ago. And he is not the first time in Slovakia, so, but welcome here again. I'm also very happy that <laughs> he deserves it. Uh, I'm also very happy that his counterpart will be Roman Joch, uh, Slovak uh, living in Prague, uh, head, of, uh, head of Civic Institute and lecturer at uh, two universities in Prague. Uh, professor Bertiglioni is also a teacher at, uh, uh, a professor at San Pius V University in Rome. Not, not any longer? Not anymore. Not any longer, um, um, uh, my apologies. The Lateran University. Lateran University. And uh, former minister of two portfolios, EU affairs or EU policies and culture between 2001 and 2006. Um, uh, professor, you, you have become uh, most important for something what you have not achieved, <laughs> uh, to be a commissioner for justice, freedom and security. Uh, today we will discuss uh, not only lesson from 2004 uh, when uh, majority of uh, commission of Europe, Euro member, Euro, European members of parliament voted against you, but also about other progresses somehow inter inter interconnected, uh, certainly with the um, with, uh, situation in the church. Uh, the year after you were not chosen to be a commissioner, Pope Joe Paul II has died and since then a lot has changed and you are a great defender of Pope Francis. So tonight we will discuss also um, pontificate of, of Pope Francis. And uh, uh, Roman Joch, he is um, uh, not only a, um, uh, a frequent um, and brisk commentator, but uh, also a, a, a one of the intellectuals who signed the um, Paris statement, uh, statement on Europe, Europe we can believe in. Uh, what is a paper uh, signed by such distinguished intellectuals as Pierre Manet, Rémy Braque, Roger Scruton, uh, or Richard Legutko from, from Poland. So, but um, we have to start with you, Professor, and with two things. Uh, on the one hand, you, you have become symbol of, um, of a Catholic politician who said what he believes in uh, and who could not be a commissioner. Um, you faced huge pressure and uh, your example was uh, example for many politicians or test for many politicians. But um, last year, you approved um, legislation in Italy um, on uh, civil partnerships. You voted in favor. Um, that is something in contradiction. Why? Um, because your comments were broadly, the first comments in, in, in Brussels uh, were broadly understood as a defense of uh, traditional morality. And later on, you improved. No. Well, uh, can you hear me? First of all, I must beg your pardon for not being able to speak your wonderful language. If I were younger, I would promise you to learn. <laughs> At my age, it is a little bit more difficult. But who knows? Let us start with uh, Brussels. I did not want to become a symbol. I wanted to become um, a commissioner in the uh, European Commission. <laughs> I, I, rather, I wanted to become the vice president of uh, the European Commission. And I think I would have been a good one. Um, but uh, uh, they wanted to know what I think on homosexuality, on homosexuality from a moral standpoint. They wanted me to tell them the contrary of what is written in the catechism of my church. And I could not do this. Uh, and so I tried to be as prudent as possible. Uh, and I said, 
I may think, um, I may think, that it's not exactly the same as I think. It means I, I have the right to think. It is possible that I think. I may think that uh, homosexuality is morally objectionable. Um, nevertheless, I am against the discrimination of homosexuals. Um, and I am ready to defend their rights as the rights of everybody else. Uh, and uh, uh, it was not enough. Uh, they <laughs> wanted me to say that in uh, uh, homosexuality, there is nothing morally objectionable. Uh, but I think there is something. If you want a letter, I, I explain you why. And then uh, when they put pressure on me, uh, I remembered, uh, well, in politics there is also a way out, if you want. Uh, but I remembered the words of Jesus. Uh, those who feel ashamed of me in front of men, I shall be ashamed of them in front of my father. And I asked myself, do I feel ashamed of my church and of my Lord? And then I took the most prudent position. Uh, that is, no, I am not ashamed, and I refused the compromise. Uh, also, I was helped by the remembrance of uh, a visit I had made to Scotland. Have you ever been to Scotland? Yes. Yeah. Perhaps some of you may have gone along uh, the whiskey path. It is the path along which there are the most famous distilleries of whiskey of Scotland. In the same path, you find the most beautiful ancient castles of Scotland. Uh, they were all destroyed between 1646 and 1746. In one century, Catholicism was eradicated from Scotland with fire and sword. And uh, in one of these castles, the Castle of Gordon, there is an inscription with the last words of the Count of Gordon, or the Earl of Gordon. Uh, uh, when they brought him to the scaffold, they offered him freedom and land, and land if he subscribed to uh, the uh, act of uh, uh, obedience. And he answered, it is easier to sever my head from my body than my heart from my Lord. And then I said, it is easier to sever my bottom from my chair than my heart from my Lord. <laughs> Don't laugh too easily. For a politician, it is almost <laughs> equally <laughs> painful. <laughs> but however, I had no other choice, and I, I did that. Um, uh, it was painful. Why? Um, the commission uh, is not a government. Some people forget this distinction. Uh, in, the, in a government, you have people who belong to one political direction. And I don't feel offended if in Italy somebody votes against me being a minister in government. Of course, if he is not of my party and if not an allied party, they have all the right to do that. But in the Commission, it is different because people coming from different governments, the governments, the national governments, bring the people within the Commission. And it is normal that they should belong to different parties. There are only two reasons why you can refuse uh, uh, a commissioner. Either he is grossly incompetent, and in my political life, I have been accused of all possible sins, but never of incompetence. The only thing that <laughs> everybody always uh, uh, acknowledged to me was that I more or less um, know what I say, I understand what I do. Uh, and the, uh, the second reason is moral indignity. Then, to hold the, the position that in homosexuality there is something morally objectionable uh, uh, seems to qualify me as a man who is unworthy. I consider this as a personal offense, and I was also worried because this seemed to imply that all those who hold the same position of the catechism of the Catholic Church are unworthy to be commissioners or citizens of the Union. And this was also 
the protest. It was, it was a great uh, support to me in those difficult moments. Uh, the words of John Paul II, who asked, uh, please, do not forbid Catholics to stand in the service of the European Union. I must say that several years ago, uh, another man who said more or less the same things that I had said, Jan Borg, uh, won the struggle and became commissioner. Sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. Um, this as what regards Brussels. What have I done in Italy? There was a strong pressure to make a law uh, on homosexual marriage. Then I said, no, why not? Because um, the problem is not that I do not want homosexuals. I have nothing against homosexuals. Uh, not, uh, uh, the problem is not that I don't want homosexuals to get married. The problem is that you are destroying marriage because marriage is an institution that has the purpose of uniting a man and a woman in order to have children. The center of marriage are the children. No children, no marriage. Marriage comes from the Latin, and the root is the word mater, mother. No mother, no marriage. No children, no marriage. If you create an uh, institution that uh, in, their in, in, an indif uh, in an indifferentiated uh, way covers the affective relations of homosexuals and uh, the marriage to have children, then you destroy the possibility to give an adequate juridical form to my intention of living together with women, to have children with her, and to educate them because they are two different things and they require two different laws. And we made a compromise. If you want, because marriage is not just an affective and erotic relationship. It is also, of course, an affective and erotic relationship. But it is this and something more, an affective and erotic relationship oriented towards the uh, generation, the upbringing, the education of children. And we made a compromise. We had a disparate minority in Parliament. They could have done what they wanted, but they were afraid. We put up a, a, a good uh, fight, and they were afraid of going to the last consequences of their position. Let us make a, a, a law to protect the uh, interests that an homosexual couple may have among themselves. Let us make it clear this is not marriage. Let us preserve marriage for those who want to get married. That's the law that we have, uh, have done. Uh, and I think it was a responsible decision to make this law. By the way, the alternative would have been to have homosexual marriage in Italy, which we did not have. Uh, was it all what you asked? Uh, I have further question. Uh, you, you said you called it compromise, and that's, that's the problem, uh, because in, um, we all know that uh, uh, when we are speaking about uh, marriage of same-sex people, that it's that we don't mean anything mean against these persons. It's not necessary to even talk about this. But um, but uh, we see a progress in uh, constitutional courts, in area of constitutional courts, especially in European courts, where certain institutions are being. Eroded not eroded, they're being explained by judges as something else. And uh, there are a few examples, uh, judicial de decisions, where the partnership of persons is um, being explained as inst institution equal to marriage. Is that a compromise then, what you achieved in Italy? Well, you are right. Uh, first, uh, I am convinced that politics requires compromises. Uh, only, I wish to quote my friend uh, Josef Tischner, uh, who uh, once said, in order to make a good compromise, you must love truth without compromises. So there are good compromises and bad compromises. 
I think the compromises with the military was not bad. Uh, it is true, once you make a compromise in the courts, they will try to push it further, to gain in the courts what they did not succeed in gaining in parliament. And my answer is yes, of course. And we must re be ready to defend your compromises in the courts. You cannot pretend parliament to make a law that excludes any possible misinterpretation. If one wants, if you have politized judges, if we have judges who uh, are convinced that their mission is to turn the law upside down, they will try to do it. And you must be able to defend the law in the tribunals. And this is what we are doing. I hope we succeed. Uh, uh, in any case, the other way would have been to have uh, the legislation on homosexual marriage in Italy. What our law foresees is not bad. Uh, if one of them dies uh, and he has a rent contract, he can't, the surviving one can have the rent contract. And it regards a lot of facilitation for the life of the people that uh, do not interfere with the central point. The central point is the uh, upbringing, the generation, the upbringing, the education of children. And it excludes also uh, the so-called uterus on rent. That is the, uh, the dramatic challenge that is uh, in, the, in the next years in front of us. Mm, I, we can discuss whether it was a good compromise or a bad compromise, uh, but uh, uh, I, uh, it was the best we succeeded in doing in Italy on this occasion. I will now, now ask uh, Dr. Rioch to join our debate and, and move the question further. Um, what, if this, what if this battle uh, Professor Botulione is talking about is lost already? What if the Kurds are in such a state that this, lost is, this battle is not possible to win in Europe? And furthermore, what if Europe is now divided between West, where basically all the Western European countries have the bills on either same-sex unions as marriages or partnerships. And in the East, we see the contrary trend that basically all the Eastern European countries have constitutional amendments saying that uh, marriage is a uh, union of one man and one woman. What, what such a division means for the future of, of Europe? Well, <coughs> well, we shall see. It's still open. And even perhaps more important is uh, what are going to be two very important court decisions, one in Europe, in, in particular in the United Kingdom, and the other one in the United States. But to return a little bit to, to, the, to the basic issue of either registered partnership or same-sex unions and or gay marriage. In the Czech Republic, uh, the law establishing, in Czech Republic it's called registered partnership, but it's same-sex unions, uh, was uh, approved in 2006, if I am mistaken, 12 years ago. And from Czech gay community, gay and lesbian community, uh, the MPs were told that that was the last demand. We don't demand any adoptions as same-sex couples, any adoptions of children and nothing else. It will just make our life easier. It will harm nobody. At that time, I was against that law because I considered it to be unnecessary. Adult people in a free society could live together, uh, two men, two women, three men, five women together, whatever. Uh, however, I don't consider it to be necessary that the government must give them uh, a stamp of approval, just tolerate, live and let live. However, now we see that gay and lesbian community in the Czech Republic demands the right to adopt children as registered partners. And it was in the last parliament, but eventually there was no vote because social democrats feared they would be defeated even more they, than they were. And secondly, from the gay and lesbian community, we now hear demands for uh, gay marriage. They call it marriage equality. And the uh, great blow against resistance towards that idea was of course the law passed in Germany. When it was in, passed in Germany last summer, 
uh, the pressure on the Czech Republic will be very high. So might be the Czech Republic will pass the law on gay marriage. I agree with Professor Butilione that there is no such a thing as gay marriage. Uh, if we call it a marriage by law, it's doesn't make it doesn't make it into a marriage if there is a law that from tomorrow spring autumn and winter are going to be called summer then spring autumn and winter will not become summer so i now consider a law a bill establishing civil unions to be just the first step first beachhead uh, conquered by a pressure a movement to completely redefine legally what marriage is but still, we might ask, why to care? We will know what marriage is, and if some people consider another kind of relationship to be marriage, even if it is not marriage, it will not affect us. Well, I thought so. <laughs> Unfortunately, the situation is much worse. Once it is recognized as a gay marriage, or homosexual marriage, as a right, legal right, uh, you cannot discriminate against that which is a good thing, I am against discrimination against persons. I would really be against discrimination of gays, lesbians, because of their sexual orientation. However, some people demand that you must not voice any reservations or doubts or simply a moral disagreement. And the case in Belfast, Ulster, in the United Kingdom, was a case of so-called Escher's Bakery a bakery, private bakery owned by one evangelical couple, Mr. and Mrs. Mac MacArthur's, and they refused to prepare a cake with an inscription, sugar inscription, uh, celebrate gay marriage. And they said there are many other bakeries who would prepare for you, sir, such a, such a cake with an inscription, celebrate gay marriage. But we as uh, evangelical Christians, we don't believe there is such a thing as gay marriage. So we cannot do that, it's against our conscience. They lost, they were coerced to pay a penalty. However, they appealed to the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, and the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom will decide the issue, the case, next month in, uh, in May. So there are two options. First, they will win. And freedom of speech, including the speech to criticize what one considers to be inappropriate or immoral, will be preserved. By the way, after the, the decision, it was in fall 2016, one British gay activist criticized the decision because he claimed, rightly in my view, that you cannot coerce people to say what they disagree with. And he said now, uh, gay bakers will be coerced by law to prepare cakes with inscriptions they would consider to be homophobic. So even some classical liberal oriented people from gay community in Britain criticized the case, the, the, the result of the, of the court in Belfast. We shall see what will be the, the decision by the Supreme Court. And the same situation is the United States. It's called uh, Masterpiece Cakes, uh, Masterpiece, Masterpiece Bakery, Colorado versus Masterpiece Bakery. And it's the same, the hearings, oral hearings were there in the United States in the fall, and the de decisions should be issued in, in June. Again, if the baker uh, wins the case, everybody could live and let live. It will be called gay marriage, okay, but nobody of us would be coerced to say, to proclaim, which is against our conscience. However, if uh, the case is lost, uh, for any criticism, of uh, homosexual activity as sinful according to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, for any expressions of such a view, uh, you could be accused of a hate speech, of a crime of hate speech, and you might receive a high penalty or even go to prison. So uh, gay lifestyle, lifestyle will receive a legal immunity and would be untouchable. And that would be a dramatic shift in our understanding of human freedom. Uh, we, will be, we will not be a free, free society anymore, but still the jury is out, as they call it. Uh, both cases are open and we shall see what will be the decisions. There, there is, sure, 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 please. Uh, I wish to add two points, uh, because the problem is, is enlarging. One issue is uh, 
the issue of uh, uh, the adoption for gay couples. Uh, in Italy, we have this problem. Although the law is against it, uh, a few days after the law, uh, a very well-known uh, representative of the Italian uh, political gay community uh, came back from Canada uh, with a child. And everybody was happy and said, oh, we are happy because the human life is always positive, it's always good when a child is born. Let us forget about the way in which she came to life, but it is good that the child is here, compliments. And I said, uh, I am also happy for the existence of this child, but I cannot forget the fact that somewhere there is a mother without her child, and there is a child without her, without uh, his or her mother, I don't know whether he was a boy or a girl. Um, there is uh, uh, one peculiar experience that is constitutive of femininity, and we males will never have. It is the experience of uh, carrying under your heart a child for nine months, pregnancy. And after pregnancy, giving birth to the child. And for nine months, the child hears the heart beating of the mother, and uh, this enters to constitute his first self-consciousness. And then she will uh, stay with the mother and have the milk of the mother. And uh, this creates a relationship between mother and child that cannot be substituted. Well, you know, you can say you have adoption. And uh, if, uh, uh, if, uh, um, if one of my friends should die, I could take care, he and his wife, I could take care of his children. Yes, it is true. Uh, if you have a car accident, I try to help you to recover from the car accident. But in this case, we cause a car accident. We provoke a car accident that had no reason to exist in order to be able <laughs> to cure the children after the traumatic separation from their mother. And also the mother, she will, um, she will always suffer what she has done. Perhaps she was hungry and did it for money. It is violence against the women. Perhaps she was in a disturbed psychic situation. There is violence against the women. You cannot say she agreed. Uh, if uh, you agree to a salary that is inferior to the minimum for life, you cannot say it was a contract, he did accept this salary, there is no problem. There is a problem. And the same holds true in the case of a mother that allows her child to be taken away from her. So uh, the, the next battle in Italy is not so much that on hate speech, uh, it is the battle on adoption. Adoption for gay couples. And we go always back to the fundamental idea. A, can we call marriage uh, a relation between two homosexuals uh, if there is not the finality of marriage? Uh, it is not against them, it is for me. I want my children to enter into the most beautiful adventure of my life, the adventure of uh, falling in love to a girl, uh, getting married with her, having children with her, and sharing life with her. I try to educate them to this. And to do this, I need to have a model, a model that must be also recognized in law. In the moment in which I fall in love, I want to give to my love the support of a juridical institution. If you create a marriage, within brackets, a marriage that is common to, to so different situations, you deprive me of the possibility of having a, a juridical institution tailored on the demands, on the, the needs that are proper to this situation. So I don't want to forbid uh, gay people anything. I want to defend my right to have an institution called marriage that corresponds to my intention of uh, living with a woman and have children with her.
Uh, I would add that we quite, we quite clearly know that the next step is not a tolerance, that uh, the new persecution is coming after this uh, so-called rights battle. But I would like to move from this right debate to a political debate. Um, we see division in Europe. Well, we, we have witnessed a lesson that uh, when you were uh, trying to be a commissioner and when the EU constitution was uh, ratified, uh, the battle about values. We learned in that time, 2004 and 5, that uh, we basically do not share the same values. God could not be mentioned, neither Christianity could, want, could not be mentioned in preamble. Uh, someone who was talking about sin could not be a commissioner. Uh, now we are a step further. We don't have the same law. We don't have the same bills on definition of marriage, the same fundamental institution we understand differently. In Eastern European countries, even former communists vote for uh, constitutional amendments on, uh, uh, on uh, definition of marriage in a traditional way. What this means for future of Europe, this division in law? Who wish to start can start. Well, we shall see. You are right that many countries in Central Eastern Europe have passed constitutional amendments uh, reserving the legal name of marriage to a union of one man, one woman. And uh, in Western Europe, we see the very opposite. Uh, it, uh, not in a direct legal way, but in some indirect ways, there are even uh, recognized uh, plural marriages, I mean uh, polygamy. Uh, when somebody uh, got an as asylum uh, in Western Europe, I, m I believe the case was the case of either Germany or Britain, I don't remember now. So a gentleman received uh, an asylum because of war or persecution in the Middle East, and then he was entitled to invite his four wives because, of course, he cannot have four wives uh, according to local law, but he married them according to the laws of his native country. So so the host country, Western European country, recognized them as his four wives de facto. So I don't really don't know what will happen. Uh, on the one hand, the European Union and the European Union is very flexible. So you see countries, uh, 23 countries, who recognize the independence of Kosovo, and you see five uh, EU countries, including Slovakia and some others, Spain, Romania, Greece, Cyprus, who do, don't recognize uh, any independence of Kosovo. Kosovo is perceived as a part of Serbia. So on such an important uh, issue, is that as an independent state or not? We don't have consensus in the EU, and EU works with that. And it is a really serious issue that one political union has different views on the issue who is that guy? He's a prime minister or some rebel leader or what? So uh, hypothetically, hypothetically, uh, EU could exist with different uh, definitions of marriage in the West and in the East. However, we know reality, and the reality will be that the Western pressure will be quite strong, that all must accommodate the, the Western European model. Uh, what will be the reaction of the of European courts? I, I don't know, but uh, um, according to Lisbon Treaty, the definition of marriage belongs to nation states. So the the the, the proper the the polite thing will be to recognize plurality of views in the EU. Well, I wish to give two answers to one question. The first answer. Uh, continues what he just said right now. That is, um, family law does not belong to the sphere of competence of the European Parliament or of the European uh, Commission. Family law falls entirely within the sphere of competence of the member states. Can you have a common family law in uh, the European Union? Yes, you can. We, according to the unanimity rule, that is all must agree. If I, if Malta does not agree, 
the common European law cannot be made. This means it is competence of the uh, member states. So it is, I think it is good that it should be so, and I think it is a scandal that the European Parliament uh, now and then approves resolutions on uh, issues that fall completely outside of the sphere of competence, trying to put pressure on the public opinion of other countries on issues that belong to the reserved sphere of the member states. That's the first answer. The second answer, um, well, let us see it from a, uh, politically. We have had in Europe a great movement um, in, uh, at the end of the 70s, at the beginning of the 80s. Um, the Spirit of God put his finger in European history with the election of John Paul II. And under his, under his spiritual leadership, um, the basis of the communist regimes began to collapse in front of a resistance that was a moral, cultural, and religious resistance that never made use of violence, that paid with the, with the blood of ours, but we never shed the blood of the oppressors, making an appeal to the conscience of the oppressors. And we had a new Euro Europe. The order, the political order of Yauta fell. It was a moment of great joy and of great danger. Because uh, in this country and in other countries of Central and Eastern Europe, people lost the securities given by the communist state without having a functioning uh, market economy. And uh, uh, there was a tremendous danger that all the hatred that had been repressed in the years of communists could explode. The demand for revenge of all against the communists, but also of uh, one nation against another nation, of one group against another group. It was the miracle of John Paul II to canalize these energies, not towards revenge, but towards forgiveness and reconstruction. And this found a great ally who was Helmut Kohl. Helmut Kohl used this enormous moral energy for a political project. I had the privilege of being in this process, being a friend of Helmut and a friend of John Paul II, and helping sometimes to uh, keep the relationship between the two, who not always readily agreed with one another, um, to say it di diplomatically. Uh, but nevertheless, they felt that they had a common responsibility in front of Europe. And we had uh, the German unification, we had uh, the, uh, the enlargement, yeah, we had the functioning market economy in, the, in these countries, an enormous growth of wealth, but we did not want the enlargement. What we wanted was something different. It was the reunification of Europe. The idea of enlargement has brought with itself the idea that we were already Europe without you. You want to come? Please come, according to our rules. The idea of reunification is that you had rediscovered under communist oppression some fundamental European values. I remember uh, here the, the people gathering in the years of communism with Cardinal Koretz in Prague with uh, Cardinal Volk. Both, of course, were not cardinals. Uh, uh, and the rediscovery of the great European tradition, Christian, but not only Christian, also Greek and Roman, and in Poland, the uh, underground university and so forth. What we wanted was a reunification in which this experience was accepted as an integral part of our cultural European heritage. When they did not want to accept the Christian values in the Constitution, this is what they refused. We wanted the Christian values, not just because of the Middle Ages, but because of contemporary European history, as a recognition of that rediscovery that had taken place in these countries. And after having uh, gained a lot of battles, we lost. Between 1998 and 2005, uh, we lost uh, uh, a series of battles. We wanted the Christian values in the Constitution. We did not have them. 
we did not even have the Constitution. We had the Lisbon Treaty that uh, is uh, something that has no soul. We had a project for Europe. Those who won had no idea of Europe. We have had 10, 15 years without a European project. You see the people protesting against this Europe. I understand them. I am completely pro-European, but I understand them. Be why? Because Europe is like a beautiful castle with tapestries on the walls, with f elegant furniture, but uh, there is no roof, no ceiling. And when it rains, it rains within. We have had the Europe of, the so-called Europe of rights, without duties. W a Europe in which rights meant the right to uh, ignore your relationship to the others, your duties in front of the others. And then, and then, uh, then arrived the crisis. In front of the crisis, we realized that we had to stick together or to fall. We have overcome this crisis. Before the next crisis, either we bring forth again the original project for Europe, uh, the project that wanted to give to Europe a soul, or we will not survive the next crisis. That will come, not soon. It will take five years, 10 years, 15 years, I don't know. That is the political issue. Uh, it is not so much that we have a, Europe, a Western Europe, a Europe and an Eastern Europe with different, uh, we have only one Europe. Either we save this Europe altogether or this Europe will fall and the results will be dramatic for all, for the West as well as for the East. Professor, I have to contradict you, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I'm afraid that we don't only are losing the value debate, that we don't have a unity of value, that we don't share the same values in Europe, that we don't understand the law in the same way. And I'm afraid that after migration crisis, migration crisis, we have, uh, our societies are becoming more and more different. Um, Pew Research Center uh, respected uh, fact think, not a think tank, but fact, fact think, uh, recently published, um, published um, a survey about future of Islam in Europe, showing that basically there will be a new division across Europe between West and the East. In the, in the Western societies, there will be Muslim minorities from 10 to 30 percent in Sweden in 2040. In the Eastern Europe, there will be under 5 percent minorities, basically irrelevant, um, politically ir irrelevant. Um, this, this poses a new risk. The societies will be different in the West and the East. The understanding of nation of interreligious uh, relations within the societies will be different. Politics, once you have a 20 or 30 percent minority in the society, politics will be different. Um, what will this mean for United Europe? Before the last German elections, the political German elections, there had been some uh, minor regional elections, and it was very striking, the success of AfD in uh, um, uh, Mecklenburg for Pommer. And uh, I delivered a lecture at the Political Academy in Munich, and I said, excuse me if I quote myself, but professors uh, <laughs> cannot help it. Uh, and, and I said, look, you know, in Mecklenburg for Pommer, there is no migration. Everybody said the, re the result is due to uh, migration policies. And I said, well, look, there are no, no migrants in Mecklenburg for Pommern. The real problem is not migration. The real problem is the identity of the German people. Because they, those who come in, have an identity. And we must ask ourselves, what are we? If we have an identity, then we can have a reasonable policy in front of migration. If we don't have, then, then we feel insecure and uh, th we uh, oscillate between two possibilities. Uh, let's send them all back or let them occupy the public space because they have an identity and we don't. So the real problem is the identity of Europeans. Uh, and also the other problem is 
a reasonable migration policy. Um, God has given the art to all men, but this, uh, the art has been divided among different nations. Uh, and uh, we must love all men, but according to a principle of neighborhood, I am responsible for my children in a more direct way than for the children of my sisters, and for the children of my sisters in a more direct way than for the other children of uh, my borough, and for those of my borough more directly than those of another country. Uh, if uh, a, a, a woman takes more interest into the children of Africa than in her own children, there is something wrong with that woman. Um, then we must have a policy. Uh, and um, uh, yes, if a child has no father and no mother, he is my child. I must take care of him. That's the parable of the Samaritan. But if he has a mother, I give him back to his mother. And if he stands in need of help, I help him with his mother and through his mother. When we had a European policy, when we had a European policy, European policies, we knew this. And we had a program. And we said, uh, the welfare can be defended only if you expand it. We must have a project for Africa to expand welfare in Africa, to create political stability in Africa, to make of Africa the partner of Europe for the future development of mankind. A great friend of mine, um, Mrs. Loyola de Palacio, before dying, she died young, but she has been the best uh, commissioner of Europe, was studying exactly what, what should we do. We must create a, a common market in North Africa, we must create infrastructure, we must, we must. Uh, and then it was for, in, in when I uh, wanted to become a commissioner, I wanted, because I had this program, and I exposed this program in front of the European Parliament. They did not want to talk about that. They wanted to talk about, about other things. Of course, it was much easier 10, 15 years ago than now. But the principle is the same. We must expand the welfare. If you tell to the countries from which these people come, I give them back to you. You help me to identify them and you take them back. But I give you support to create three uh, jobs for each one that I send you back. They would agree. And uh, you don't send back people to starve. You send back people to their country to, have to work for their country, to work in their country for the welfare of their country and also for our welfare. We need a policy. But the problem is that we have it and it's different. We have different Merkel policy and different Orban policy. We don't have European policy. We have the Western policy and Eastern policy. And we have the conflict about these policies. We don't have neither Western policies nor Eastern policies. We have politicians uh, talking, talking, talking without having any real idea of what is the real solution. Because you cannot have a migration policy if you do not have a neighborhood policy. And uh, that is the point. And you cannot have a neighborhood policy if uh, you do not have a common uh, European vision. And there is a solution if we act all together. But uh, a common program for Africa, is, it is not something that Slovakia alone can do, nor Italy alone can do, nor any European country alone can do. Um, look, the world is changing. Demographically, Europe is becoming smaller and smaller. Economically, Europe is becoming smaller and smaller. Uh, politics has acquired today a continental dimension. In the 15th century, Italy was the wealthiest country of Europe, the most accultural countries of Europe, and probably the happiest country of Europe. But history put on the table the problem of the national dimension of politics. Spain found a solution, France found a solution, Italy didn't. And for several centuries, all the tensions of the European system were discharged on Italy. We were the poorest, the most oppressed, the most humiliated people of Europe. In the world of tomorrow, uh, China has the continental, not more the national, the continental dimension of policy. India has this dimension. United States, they have this dimension. Uh, Russia, I don't know. Might have, might have not. And Europe? If we don't find a solution to this problem, 
and we can find a solution only together, uh, then we are lost. Uh, Dr. Yo, how, how do you see the division? Uh, Bulgarian liberal Ivan Krastev said in his last book that the migration crisis is a September 11th for Europe. Something what changes the paradigm. Uh, how do you see future of Europe with these diversities and conflicts, political uh, And Ivan Krastev and one of his colleagues uh, wrote another very important essay. Uh, quite read and circulated on the internet on on the on uh, on, uh, on how uh, Western, both European and American left liberals don't understand resentments among other people, and that's why other people vote for politicians considered to be either clownish or dangerous or both. Uh, well, but uh, anyway, to back to your, like Trump or some others, but uh, back to your to your question. First of all, I, I agree with Professor Butlione that it would be great that we have one common European policy position, but it's quite difficult to achieve because the difference is very substantive and huge. Uh, I, I would now be more optimistic. I think that we, we Central Eastern Europeans have more or less won the argument and uh, even many Western European politicians know in their hearts that we were right, that it was a huge mistake to accept such a massive wave of immigrants in 2015. And many politicians in Bavaria and Austria look at the incumbent Austrian Chancellor, Mr. Sebastian Kurz, who was a Minister of Foreign Affairs of Austria, and he was one of the politicians responsible for uh, blocking the Balkan a Balkan way in 2016 after after the first year of that great uh, massive immigration. I I agree that many we Europeans don't have strong identity or many of us don't have strong civilizational identity and migrants from North Africa, Middle East have very strong identity and that the fault is ours primarily but in such a situation to welcome huge numbers of immigrants uh, from very strong culture would be very dangerous for our society and uh, now we must even um, mention something um, which is quite difficult to mention that uh, no n that not all civilizations are equal for example people don't behave in different civilizations in the same way uh, in czech republic we have a huge immigration from the ukraine ukrainians are uh, rather poor people but they integrate immediately. They learn Czech, their children are normal Czech children. Uh, we have Russian community, it's much more wealthier and it is self-isolating. Self-isolated, they don't like to mix with others, with us, lesser breeds, as, as uh, Untra mentioned. Uh, but th they are quite wealthy and, and live and uh, are not so violent. Then we have a Vietnamese community. Uh, the parents, the generation of parents, they don't have Czech friends. Uh, they live separate lives, but their children are the best among the best Czech students. They speak beautiful, perfect Czech. They win many competitions, both in poetry, in mathematics, in physics, and others. I have, I have, um, I have seen on the streets of Prague uh, a mixed couple. I mean, racially mixed Czech boy, Vietnamese girl, teenagers kissing each other, or vice versa. So we are going to have mixed. Uh, mixed marriages, and Vietnamese are going to be uh, the part of the next Czech, Czech elite. They are going to be part of the elite of the Czech society. Is there a problem with that? No, not in my eyes. A Vietnamese communist is hardworking, uh, self-reliant, and putting a great focus on the education of their children. Perfect citizens. More of them, the better. However, inside, unfortunately, inside Islamic civilization, there is a minority, but very virulent, very vicious minority, which hates us and would like to kill us, to put it openly. I agree that the majority of Muslims would like to live a better life, are not ideological, not radical. However, that minority is, if we accept extraordinary number of Islamic migrants, the, the odds are going to be that among them will be those radicals. And what's even, even more worse than radicals today is 
and we see it in communities in Western Europe, that young boys, young teenagers in the second, third generation are more radical, are being radicalized much more than their parents or grandparents. And that's li like a ticking bomb. So now the consensus is we should not accept unlimited number of especially Islamic uh, immigrants. Does it mean that we should not help poor people in Africa or in the Middle East? Yes, we should. But it's much more prudent and even more efficient to do in the countries of origin or in the safe countries uh, in the regions of their origin. For one million euro, you can provide education for more children in, let us say, Turkey or Jordan or Egypt than in Germany or Sweden, because the costs are much higher in Germany and Sweden. So we should help, but prudently. I would agree that we should uh, try to break down economic barriers, practice more free trade free with those countries, free movement of goods, but not necessarily free movement of persons. Free trade could enable them to be more uh, wealthy. Uh, and uh, anyway, I think that the, the sources of energy for better life must come from inside the community. Uh, Western world did not help too much to South Korea after Korean War or to Taiwan after Chinese Civil War. And look now at South Korea and Taifan, Taiwan. Free societies, developing societies, wealthy societies, emerging societies. So the energy must come from within. The, the best what can we do is to don't close ourselves to their goods, to, to, to have a freer, completely free trade would be perhaps impossible because of our domestic producers, but more freer trade. And that's, in my view, the long-term solution. Uh, e Europe is wealthy, but Europe cannot accept and welcome every single poor person from the world who would like to live in Europe. We simply cannot do that. It would be a suicide of our society. Before we open the uh, debate and I start to collect the questions, uh, the last one uh, on Pope Francis. Um, we see in last months and years that uh, texts written by uh, Pope Francis are being uh, interpreted in various ways. We can see a traditional interpretation as well as unorthodox interpretation. Uh, professor, you tried to moderate the debate. You tried to. Um, you wrote a book, uh, "Friendly Answers to to, to Critics of uh, Amaris Let Letizia," and um, you are offering a friendly view of Pope Francis' uh, production, <laughs> so to say. Um, uh, aren't you afraid? that if such a division exists, that if the same sentence can be interpreted in various ways, that it might be a danger for the future of the church? Of course. That's the reason why I've written a book to explain that the only right interpretation is mine. <laughs> <laughs> and all other interpretations are wrong. Um, I, uh, I am really friendly to the critics because some of them are my, are my dear friends. Uh, uh, Joseph Seifert, we have been friends for 30 years, 40 years, I don't know how many, and we have led many battles, cultural battles together. Robert Speyman, uh, another one, Stanislav Griegel, and so forth. I think they are wrong. Uh, why? John Paul II has clearly stated that, that there are, and there is also an old traditional doctrine, that there are things that by themselves are always wrong. There is, the, the moral law is an objective law. So do not commit adultery uh, is a, a, a precept that is always valid. Are we agreed on this? That's the doctrine of the church, without exceptions against uh, a, a, a mainly German theology that wanted to affirm that no, uh, the moral qualification of an act depends upon the circumstances. Under circumstances, what normally is bad can become good. And the position is no. It can, adultery can never be good. And Pope Francis does not say 
There is no place in, uh, in the, the writing of Amoris Laetitia that says that adultery uh, or sexual relations outside of marriage can be good. That's false. I'm ready to demonstrate it. I, we would need a, a, a university seminar, but I can do that if you want. I must say that uh, my book has been accepted, after all, in the scientific uh, discussion as the last word on this issue. What is what Pope Francis says? Pope Francis says that uh, when uh, I see that a certain state of affairs is bad, this does not always mean that the subject, who is the author of that state of affairs, is equally bad. Because uh, there are attenuating circumstances and also circumstances that can uh, uh, eliminate the responsibility for the act. Let us make one example. Take a woman who, is in, uh, 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 who lives with a man. Uh, she's divorced. She has contracted a new marriage with a man. And she wants to go back to the church. She was a baptized uh, woman, but without a real a strong Christian faith without um, uh, an adequate uh, uh, Christian education. Then she uh, encounters a, a community of people, a movement, and wants to go back to the church. Um, shall we say that if she remains uh, in the situation in which she is, is always uh, guilty? Imagine the case in which, and there are many, in which this woman would like to interrupt the sexual relations to the man with whom she lives, but he does not agree. And she's completely dependent upon him economically, psychologically, emotionally. Shall we say that she is always uh, guilty? Or shall we say that uh, we must tell her, have confidence in God, try look for a job, so that you are no more uh, economically dependent, perhaps enter into a therapy, a psychological therapy, so you will not be uh, so psychologically dependent and so forth, are circumstances that reduce the subject, subjective responsibility. I think there are. Uh, uh, there are situations in which it is difficult to get out of the situation with the best will, and uh, you must uh, have uh, a time in which you find a way out of the situation in which you have entered. Uh, and uh, I've made one example, one could make other examples. Shall we leave from one day to another a man who supported you, helped you, has been a good father for your children, and uh, does, does not accept the idea of living together without having sexual relations? Or shall you try to convince him, little by little, uh, finding the proper way and moment. This is not something new of Pope Francis. I am ready to demonstrate, and I did it, that there is the traditional doctrine of the Catholic Church. Uh, there is a wonderful uh, instruction for confessors made by a very reactionary uh, cardinal, who was a friend of mine, Cardinal Alfonso Lopez Truillo, that explains all these things much before uh, Francis was elected Pope. It was 1997. This as what regards Amoris Laetitia. Uh, but there is another problem that is the pontificate of the Pope. Look, he is a Latin American Pope. We live in a world in which the Church loses influence in Europe, becomes smaller in Europe. And Europe becomes smaller in the world. We are still convinced in Western Europe that all the world will follow our example, that we are trend-setting, that we are the avant-garde of, of mankind. But it is not true. Uh, uh, demographically, we become less and less relevant. Economically, we become less and less relevant. Uh, other countries are growing much more than us, at a much faster pace than us, China, India. Africa, Latin America, um, and we have a pope who sees the world 
not from our Western, traditional Western point of view. He sees the world from the point of view of the less developed countries, of those who have been depressed, depressed for a long time in the world. Does he make mistakes? Yes, he makes. Uh, because he does not know our reality as well as we do. But nevertheless, there is an historical fact. The church in the world grows, contrary to what, to what we think in, in Europe. In the world, the number of Christians is growing in, percent on, uh, the, in percentage on the world population. Uh, why, if we lose weight in Europe? Because Africa has made the, a dramatic decision. Africa has become Christian. In the pontificate of John Paul II, Africa south of the Sahara has become Christian. Uh, so prepare yourself for an African pope. Sooner or later, he will come. Uh, and almost one half of Catholics live in Latin America. And there is a tremendous missionary expansion in, uh, uh, in, um, in Asia, uh, South Korea, Philippines, but also uh, China. It is difficult to understand the negotiation between the church and the communist regime if you do not take into account that there is a growing community and you must find some way to protect their possibility of development. And it is similar to what happened uh, in uh, the 8th, 9th century when we had the schism uh, with the Orthodox Church. The real cause of the schism was that the Church, the Pope, began to see the world also with the eyes of the barbarians. They had converted and they started seeing the world with the eyes of uh, the, the Franks, of the Germans, of the and uh, to those of the Eastern uh, part of the Christianity, this was unacceptable. So we run the risk of a schism, yes we do. Shall we fight for the schism or against the schism? If we fight against the schism, uh, well, we must try to understand what the spirit has, has been willing when he has chosen uh, uh, Francis as Pope. Uh, Roman, um, one of the main expectations with Pope Francis uh, when he was elected as a Pope was that he will face the, how to say, disorder in Korea. Um, little mess, some corruption, problems in Korea. Um, now, more and more writers uh, see and comment on the situation and the, and the progress in Korea that the chaos is growing. Is it possible that Pope Francis will create more chaos than he solved? Oh, well, uh, he definitely is not capable to solve the problem of factions and chaos in Korea. Neither was his predecessor Benedict, neither his predecessor John Paul II. I'm afraid that the Vatican Korea is a very Byzantine organization and uh, in a foreseeable future nobody will solve that problem. But will Pope Francis make it worse? I don't know. I hope not. Uh, he's the Pope. He's humble, maybe saintly or surely saintly person. Uh, I respect him as a Pope. I disagree with most of his political views, which are not relevant to his office of the Pope. Concerning theological issues, as you have said, many of his proclamations could be interpreted in different ways. I remember he was asked, was it a year ago or even more than a year ago, by four cardinals for clar clarification. Some of them have passed away. He did not respond to their letter, which in my view was a mistake. And then other suspicions could come. And I'm afraid Professor Butlione is right that the threat of schism has not a zero probability now. I wouldn't say it has 50%. No, it's not more than 10. But now we, the, the word has been mentioned by Professor, and for a reason. The probability is not zero anymore. And Pope is the Pope. He has responsibility. All Everybody has a responsibility to avoid schism, both Pope and his critics. But he's the Pope. 
So I hope for the best and uh, don't know what will happen. The, the professor is right that Christianity is growing, Catholic Church is growing in the Southern Hemisphere. But if we look at the Christians in the Southern Hemisphere, they are more orthodox in uh, moral theology than we Europeans are or we North Americans are. If we look at the Anglican Church, Church of England, Anglican or Episcopalian, Episcopalian bishops from Africa are more conservative and orthodox. Episcopalian bishops from the North, white North America and Britain are women and gay and others. Uh, so uh, I would say the conservative, more conservative is the South and concerning the uh, the deal with China, with the Chinese Communist regime, uh, I don't think it has been a honorable deal. Uh, in my view, it was m much more like a sacrifice of Chinese Catholics loyal to the Pope for a better relations with the Chinese regime. But still, it's the authority of the Pope to decide. There were deals in the past when Popes requested uh, a consent by Catholic kings for appointment of bishops. The Catholic Church for last hundred, maybe more years, does not do that, demands independence. So Catholic Church does not ask Czech, Slovak, German government, might we please appoint this person to be the new bishop? No, they just appoint him and it is. Now the Vatican, the Holy See is going to make a concession to Chinese communist regime. That please, would you agree that that person might be the new bishop? And in my view, that's not a prudent policy. That's appeasement. But, uh, but I acknowledge that Pope has the right to decide on that. So I hope for the best and worry for something which is not completely best. Questions? If anybody raises the hand, I will choose the hand from the audience first. OK. <laughs> Piotr Samerek. Um, member of Diplomatic Corps. I will, from Poland, from Embassy of Poland. Your Excellency. So I, uh, the first question, perhaps I'd like to uh, thank you a lot, uh, Jagek, for g giving me a floor. I would like you <coughs> to ask you for a question you have, both of you have raised concerning the, uh, the help for, especially for third world or, or for Africa. Especially uh, Professor Butiliana knows and remembers very well that from the church since 40 years and in the international uh, the international world the idea of help and uh, to, to africa sustainable development of africa is, is still present so my question is why europe or also united nations because it is also the project of united nations failed to to help especially Africa, or perhaps some Asian countries, to, to establish this sustainable development, which pr probably would also resolve the problem of, of migration. So allowed these societies to grow up, like, for example, Korean societies grew up from scratches in the 50s. So I would be very grateful for <coughs> your comment on, on, on these issues. Sir. Well, um, it is not easy. It is a difficult problem. And I don't think that the United Nations have uh, the guts, I beg your pardon for using this word, to tackle this problem. You need Europe. Um, you must create conditions of political stability. And to do this, because nobody invests in a country uh, in which it can be robbed or blackmailed, so political stability. And you must know that in the beginning, political stability is difficult. Uh, in our countries, we reached political stability in the course of centuries, first through absolute monarchies, who created the monopoly of uh, the use of force. St. Augustine explains that it is better to have one tyrant than many. The problem in this country, first of all, is not that they have one tyrant, it's that they have many. If you have only one mafia boss, you pay to the mafia boss and then you can leave. If you have 10 mafia, bo mafia bosses, then uh, every day another one comes and wants to be paid. So, and uh, the man who creates the unity of force, 
uh, sometimes maybe a ruthless man. I don't say it's always used to make, it is always necessary to make use of ruthless means, but sometimes it is. Um, the public opinion in Europe has never wanted to see this fact. So first, create the, the monopoly of force. Second, you must create uh, a common market. Nobody will go to invest there if uh, all the value of the market stretching from Egypt to Morocco is more or less the same as Belgium. Who will go there to invest? You must have, and it is interrupted by uh, customs barriers. You need to have one market. To have a one market, you need infrastructure, a great investment in infrastructure. And you need a great investment in knowledge, in school, education, and so forth. You need a policy. And this policy uh, uh, demands uh, adequate investments, not only in money, but mainly in political decision, political will, political power. I remember we were on the verge of doing this. At the end of the, uh, in exactly in the year 2000, we had um, the um, European Council of Barcelona. And in Barcelona, we declared a policy. We made a, a great proclamation of a policy. Then we were defeated. And those who won did not implement this policy. That's the reason why I say we should go back to that policy. We need a, a strong political decision. This is one of the aspects of the roof that we have to build on, uh, on Europe. Uh, knowing that this, uh, at the same time, means to create in Europe a, a multicultural society. The multicultural society is not a paradise, as some think. It is not necessarily the evil or the hell, as some others think. A multicultural society is like marriage. If you choose the right woman in the right way and in the right time, it can resemble paradise. If you choose the wrong women in the wrong time and in the wrong way, it can resemble hell. Uh, uh, he made some uh, reflections on this. Uh, I made a research in Italy. There are some groups that integrate perfectly, not necessarily European groups. It goes without saying that Slovaks, uh, Polish people, and so forth integrate easily. Do you know what is the criterion of integration that I have used? the rate of criminality. Uh, you must expect migrants have a rate of criminality a little bit higher because of the stress of criminality. But you know what is the rate of criminality of Slovaks in Italy? 1.1. That is one-tenth more than Italians. If you consider, uh, good, it is no, <laughs> no problem. Polish people, 1.2. Do uh, you know what are the best among all? You will no, never believe that. Ah, you know. <laughs> you must have read my research. <laughs> well, I can tell you the reason why. The rate of criminality depends largely on the presence of women. Not only because women commit less crimes than men, but also because women control men much better than police. <laughs> well, everybody of us can remember a moment in which his mother, his wife, his sister, as uh, controlled him and avoided him to do some grossly uh, wrong action. No? Uh, and we know that other groups, I shall not name them, but there are mainly Islamic groups that are, uh, have a rate of crime that may be 30 times more than the rate of crimes of Italians. So you must have a right to regulate immigration considering the possibility of integration. It's a policy. We make speeches, we talk, uh, make philosophy, bad philosophy, let's tell me that I am a professional philosopher. We make bad philosophy of migrations and uh, we do not want empirically to put together a policy of migration that can have a success only if it is connected with a neighborhood policy. That is, is one of the great challenges that stand in front of us. I see a hand in the middle. 
organizers, we need your assistance. Please uh, stand up and say the question. Thank you. Um, I would like a question, uh, ask a question about human rights. Um, uh, the fact that human rights are a universal principle is um, is the core of their of, of this principle, and their uh, their roots are in Christian worldview. And of course, human rights need an interpretation uh, in how they translate in everyday life. So, what is, in, in your opinion, in what value framework? are or worldview or ideology are human rights interpreted today and why is it considered better than christian uh, worldview and why are we being made to embrace it thank you well i agree with you that uh, human rights or the idea or the core human rights are um, are present in the Christian religion, but I would say not only in a Christian revealed religion, but also in a in a philosophy using right reason. So without any f religious faith, using right reason, you can discover something called natural law. Natural means that it's being able to be perceived by natural means, uh, meaning human reason. So I would say that even Socratic or Greek, Socratic, and post-Socratic philosophy is able to discover human rights. Well, uh, but to your questions, there are two concepts of basic human rights now. One is the original one, and it says that human rights are natural. So they are not human invention. We cannot create rights. We can only discover them. And uh, if we cannot create them, it means that it would be a foolish thing to proclaim every human wish or whim to be a new human right. But that's exactly what's happening now. If there is something desirable or thought to be desirable, let us call it human rights. Second problem is that if human rights are natural, so not invented, governments have no power to deny them. Governments have, have not given us those rights like right to life, freedom of religion. So if governments try to take them away from us, governments are acting in an illegitimate way. The most brutal illegitimate governments in the 20th century were of course totalitarianisms, uh, Nazism and communism. They thought, well, you people have only those rights or only some of your people of good racial origin or good class origin, you have some rights that we give you and others people have no rights. Uh, so many people now who think it is a good idea to create no rights don't realize this is very dangerous because if governments or the will of majority could create new rights, it also means they can cancel and abolish old rights. And then we will be, we will be at the mercy of either governments or majorities. So that's very dangerous development. and how to call that second concept of creation of rights and new rights and new rights. There could be many, many names I would call progressivism. The idea there is a progress that in time, new beautiful things will emerge. But the danger is that they could be also diminished or even abolished. I, I they call it, well, that there is the f first generation of rights, those basic rights, life, liberty, uh, freedom of speech and so on. Then then came so-called second generation social rights. So welfare benefits, paid vacations and so on. I am not against welfare benefits and paid vacations. They are useful social conventions for loyalty in a society, for cohesion of society. But those are not fundamental rights. Those are just social, useful, prudent, generous social arrangements, but not fundamental rights. And then there are third generation cultural rights and so on and so on. So the, 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 the trend, in, from my point of view, is very dangerous and we must resist that, resist that and make the dis distinction and repeat the distinction between fundamental rights, which are in fact re liberties, respecting human dignity, and other rights, invented rights, which are claims that I want something, then government must give me that something. Uh, so 
that's an intellectual battle that we are in and <laughs> it's even more ahead of us. Uh, one question for Professor Butilione here on the table. Uh, how do you want to revitalize Christianity in European society, Professor? Two answers, please. <laughs> <laughs> I have not the slightest idea. Um, uh, the Spirit of God revitalizes Christianity uh, uh, in the world. Uh, what I can do is to watch around and see where it seems that the Spirit of God is acting. When I was a young man, I was a friend of a great uh, priest. His name was Francesco Ricci. Um, and uh, he uh, uh, used to smuggle books to uh, communist countries and to bring back manuscripts to Italy. We had a small publishing firm, and we published these uh, manuscripts. And he had a particular feeling for the places in which history was brewing. Everybody would say, ah, look, th those people, Corets, Vulk, ah, they are crazy priests. Uh, nothing good will come out of them. Havel, uh, Palush, Radim Palush, uh, uh, Giri Benda, they were our friends. And we visited them, and uh, I had, together with Richie, the feeling something is brewing here. And the same was with Wojtyła, Mazowiecki, uh, uh, and uh, the people uh, uh, in Poland. Uh, I think, and uh, uh, in Italy, I participated in a great church movement, Comunione Liberazione. Uh, in my generation, it was a powerful intervention of the spirit in our lives, uh, involving hundreds of thousands of young people, not only Comunio Liberazione, also there were other movements. So the problem is not, what shall we do? What is the spirit doing? How can I cooperate with the spirit? And I think that n right now, somewhere, some small group of young people unites, and the spirit is with them, as it was with uh, the club of the Catholic intellectuals of Warsaw uh, in, uh, uh, in the 70s, as it was with our small groups of young people who, who created the Comunione Liberazione with Don Giussani. Um, uh, I do not have the presumption of saying what should be done. I uh, would like only to be, I helped to, to see what the spirit is doing, because the spirit saves the church. Uh, Mr. Joch, where would you see the line separating some general criticism of homosexuality from shaming or defamation of concrete individuals by bakers you mentioned. Well, I would be against shaming anybody. I don't think that's a polite thing. I, the polite thing is to, if, if you have to do anything to raise your moral objections in a very calm, not passionate, way why you think or I think it's not completely morally legitimate activity but I wouldn't never ever shame a person or humiliate a person or say anything uh, hateful towards any person. Uh, when a baker or photographer or florist, those are cases in America, photographer, one lady florist, she faces jail time in Washington state if the Supreme Court doesn't reverse the local local court. Uh, if such a, a provider of service has a moral problem with an event called uh, gay marriage uh, and recommends some other florist, photographer, uh, baker that please they don't have con uh, conscientious objections order their services i cannot do that I, I i respect you as a person but i simply don't believe that the, uh, if you are a man you are able to marry other men i simply don't think that's possible so i will not participate at that event i don't think it is a shaming or humiliating of other person it's like you know uh, there is a very legal and legitimate 
political party in the Czech Republic, which is going to be part of our next coalition government in a very indirect way, and it's called the Communist Party. So it legally exists, but uh, from the fact that it legally exists, it doesn't mean that I must be coerced by law to proclaim, long live the Communist Party. I simply don't believe that, that it should be the case. Uh, there, there are people who believe that, for example, I don't know, I, I that, uh, that gypsies are lazy. Uh, I, I will fight for the right to say that the gypsies are lazy, but if somebody, if I am a baker and somebody asks me to prepare a cake with the inscription, gypsies are lazy, I will refuse to do that. I don't see any reason why should I do that. So the line is, uh, we should all have the right to disagree and to act not against our consciences. That's the line. But I'm really against shaming, humiliating anybody. I see that as a good father and teacher, you like examples, but I have to stop you. Uh, Professor Botilione, immigration in Germany and Sweden is not sustainable and there is no democratic way how to return, how to deport these people. Do you think we are heading to war or tyranny? No. Uh, I only think we need a reasonable migration policies. I don't want to deport people, but I think that if somebody uh, dwells on German soil without having a legal title to be there, he has no right of being there, and he uh, should be sent back to his country of origin. I think that this can be done. Uh, I think this can be done if you have a neighbor policy. If you make uh, a, treatise, a treaty with the country of origin, in which the country of origin accepts to take him back and to reintegrate him in the society of origin. I think this can be made. And I tell you why I think it can be made. Because I have done this. Uh, we had uh, uh, a terrible problem with the, uh, a wave of migration from Albania. Perhaps you did not notice, but it was a terrible problem in Italy in uh, uh, the beginning of, uh, the, uh, the, of this new century. And we made a good treatise with Albania, a treaty that, that has worked. Many Albanians have been integrated, many have been sent back. Uh, Albania has, been, has had, a, for a while, a growing and flourishing economy, and so could integrate those who were sent back, if they wanted to integrate, of course. Uh, now, Albania is always a flourishing economy, but it is based not so much on, uh, on, on a sound economic development, but rather on the commerce of drugs and weapons, which is a problem that we should address on other occasions. So it can work. We had also some articles about this cooperation here in Slovakia recently. But uh, uh, last two questions, um, uh, Romanioch. Uh, number of, as the number of displaced people in the world is the highest since World War II, is Germany doing a good job filling the vacuum of US leadership in refugee crisis? Germany, good job instead of USA. Well, the, the number of refugees is the largest in the history of the world because the number of people on the earth is the highest in the history of the world. So obviously, if there are living seven billion of people, there are more refugees than in the times when there was less than one billion of people. Uh, no, I don't think that uh, Germany, well, um, I, I think that Chancellor Merkel is the best among viable German politicians. I don't see anybody both viable, I mean uh, able to get to the top and better than uh, Chancellor Merkel, but I think she made a huge mistake in August 2015. Uh, so I don't think that Germany was doing well. Now it's doing better. Of course, the pride and political prudence does not allow her to admit that it was a mistake. But if you look at the German policy now, it's not the same as it used to be uh, three years ago. Uh, US, in my view, has never had any leadership in the, in the refugees uh, policies in Europe or in Africa. America has had a problem with immigration from Latin America, but didn't took any 
particular role in the in that issue in Africa or Europe or or Asia? Because uh, it's almost time to go for dinner in Italy and go to bed in Slovakia. The last <laughs> question. Um, <laughs> Professor, it's a hard question. Uh, what is the difference between good and bad compromise? What is not negotiable for the Christian politicians and how can voters be sure of what, who they voted for? Well, it is not easy to see exactly what is the difference with a good and a bad compromise. But I would say uh, it is clear that a bad compromise is a compromise that obliges me to uh, act against my conscience. Um, and to act against my conscience implies that I act uh, against the good of my people. Uh, a good compromise is a compromise that uh, respects uh, the rights of my conscience. Um, a good compromise is also a compromise that is dynamic. Uh, I have the idea that things can change. And with this compromise, I make one step ahead which does not exclude that tomorrow I shall make other steps ahead. So it is along the path. Uh, a bad compromise is a compromise that does not open any possibility for the future. And of course, when I make a compromise, I must also be aware of the fact that I have to work in order to create a better situation for the future. So there is a negative limit. Do not act against your conscience. Do not accept anything that is intrinsically evil. And there is another condition uh, that is uh, that uh, uh, you enter into a process that does not give you today all what you want or all what you need, but in the future is able to create uh, new and better possibilities. Third, a politician cannot impose to his people from the outside a, stand a moral standard. A politician must always see what is the Spirit of God doing in these people today? What is the step that the Spirit of God wants to do today? And I must create a coalition, a political coalition, that gathers all those who, can, who are willing to make that step. It is the common good, the concrete common good, the common good of today. Tomorrow, tomorrow perhaps this coalition will be dissolved and I must create a new coalition to make the step of tomorrow. So there is also, down, on one hand, an absolute limit. Don't do anything that is intrinsically evil. On the other hand, there is a positive uh, outlook. Uh, try to create uh, coalitions. Try not to pretend from your people more than what they are able to give, but pretend from them all what they are able to give. Take the example of migrations. I might desire my people to be very generous, and I must invite them to be generous. But on the other hand, I must know the limits of what I can pretend from my people, and I must not go beyond that limit if I don't want to create a backlash. And uh, I must be aware of the fact that I act on the basis of the power they give me, and I cannot betray the contract I have made with them when they have elected me. Uh, and this contract uh, foresees also limits to their generosity that cannot be trespassed. I can preach, uh, or rather the church should preach in order to have more generous hearts tomorrow. Um, another aspect of the problem is uh, that uh, uh, generosity must be intelligent. Sometimes what we pretend to be generous uh, does not really help people. Um, uh, some, uh, uh, now I take uh, the role of my friend here, some sound policies that have enhanced um, the, uh, uh, the progress, the economic and also the civil progress of the poor of the earth, uh, policies of liberalization of markets, policies of um, creation of uh, destruction of barriers, uh, policies of uh, globalization in general uh, uh, have been contrasted by some parts of the Catholic Church because uh, they were, in one sense, 
they did not believe they could work. And they, to stimulate the well understood self interest of the people, to mobilize their energies, has been more positive than to uh, give them more and more support that does not become a stimulus to take their destiny in their own hands. It is like in the family. You must support your children, but at the same time, you must sometimes push them ahead so that they take their responsibilities and do not imagine that they can remain idle. Um, so all these things enter into the idea of the good compromise. Ladies and gentlemen, let me thank you to Professor Butilione. and Dr. Roman Joch for interesting late night discussion. Thank you very much for all your questions and have a nice good evening. Thank you. Thank you.